grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord, our Savior, our leader, Jesus Christ. Amen. We turn our attention to a text I've never preached on before. You've probably never heard preached on either from Zechariah chapter 13. It's unusual enough. I'd like to reread it. Zechariah, by the way, is known as one of the prophets of Lent. And yet this text where Jesus talks about his suffering, but then also talks about our crosses, fits both in Lent and in this post-Pentecost season. You know Zechariah especially for his prophecy of Palm Sunday. Behold, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey. That's from Zechariah chapter 7. But here again, these words, Awake, O sword, this is God the Father speaking, against my shepherd and against the man who is my associate, the one who is at my side, namely the Son of God, declares the Lord of armies. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. This will take place in the whole land, declares the Lord. Two-thirds of those who remain in it will be cut off and perish, but one-third will be left in it. I will put that third into the fire, and I will refine them as silver is refined and I will test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ, there are numbers in the scriptures. Some people, of course, get all carried away with them especially the figurative numbers in the book of Revelation, the 144,000, the 1,000 years, the 12,000 stadia by 12,000 stadia by 12,000 stadia, cubic new Jerusalem. But there are also numbers in scripture that are not figurative. There really were 12 tribes of Israel, And there are the twelve apostles. There's the sevenfold gift of the Holy Spirit and the three persons of the Holy Trinity. (coughs) And today, there are the one-third who don't fall away, but who are tested by God like gold in the fire. And that's us. Us who believe in the shepherd who was struck, the Son of God who suffered for us and who leads us through suffering in the valley of the shadow of death to get us to our goal of the perfect pasture. We are the one-third in the fire. Zechariah was preaching to one-third of Judah, Judah had been taken into captivity in Babylon. After rebelling against the Lord repeatedly and refusing to repent, the Lord himself put them in the fire of captivity. If they wouldn't listen to him willingly, he would make them listen. And the purifying fire of captivity had its desired effect. In the latter days of Judah before the exile, we hear of almost no one who stood up to confess the true faith. On the other hand, already from the early days in captivity, heroes of faith once again arise. You have the three men Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three fine young 
healthy, strong, wise Jewish young men who were taken into captivity and put in the service of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Until one day, Nebuchadnezzar had a great, wonderful, harebrained idea to make a giant statue and force everybody in the kingdom to bow down to it. And he certainly had his eye, especially on his government employees. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused even after being given a second chance. And then they were thrown into the superheated fiery furnace where instead of dying they walked around peacefully with a fourth who seemed like a son of God. They came out smelling like roses purified in the fire. Later, when Darius became king in the empire, Daniel, another Jewish exile, prayed every day by his window facing Jerusalem. He was highly prized by King Darius, as he had also been earlier by Nebuchadnezzar. And so he was also envied by his co-workers because of that relationship he had with the king. And so they tricked Darius into issuing a, an irrevocable decree in the law of the Medes and the Persians that for 30 days everyone must worship the king and no other god. Well, Daniel kept kneeling down in front of his window facing Jerusalem. And therefore he was arrested and thrown into the lion's den where an angel spent the night with him holding shut the mouths of the lions. Through the fires of captivity and persecution, God refines his people like gold. And so when Cyrus became king, God put it in his heart to allow the Jews to re return to Jerusalem and to Judah to rebuild the city. How many of them went back? About a third. It was a small number. And they had enemies who sought tirelessly to prevent them from rebuilding the temple and the walls of Jerusalem. So the Lord sent the prophets Zechariah and Haggai to preach faith and courage into the small remnant's hearts, and they did. In these latter chapters, Zechariah encourages them by speaking of the glorious future of the church. As they rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem, Zechariah wanted them to see it not as the small building it really was, but as the foundation for the worldwide kingdom of the Messiah. As they looked at that little, humble, tiny, rebuilt part of Jerusalem, Zechariah encouraged them to see the new Jerusalem that would come down from heaven on that great day. So how would God bring about that glorious future, the future in which we now live? by striking the shepherd and scattering the sheep. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man who is my associate, declares the Lord of armies. That's God the Father speaking through the prophet's mouth. He's speaking of God the Son, the man who is my associate, his shepherd. Because the fire of sin has consumed the whole world, even the chosen few, the shepherd must pass through the fires of hell in their place to rescue them. God himself will cause it to happen. The great shepherd of the sheep suffers not 
to show us how to earn salvation, he suffers to himself earn salvation for the sheep. The prophet Isaiah explains more fully what Zechariah is saying. Surely he took up our infirmities. He carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples in today's gospel lesson, where he said to their great dismay, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and experts in the law. He must be killed and be raised on the third day. Jesus suffered to earn the forgiveness of sins for the world. And the disciples, well, they would suffer too. Not to earn salvation, but to be refined and preserved in the faith. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. Jesus actually quotes this passage from Zechariah to his disciples on Maundy Thursday, just before he heads to the Garden of Gethsemane. Then Jesus said to them, Tonight all of you will fall away because of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. When he, the shepherd, was arrested, the sheep, his disciples, all ran away. But as you know, he reassembled them after the resurrection, revived their faith, and sent them out refined and strengthened. From now on, they would be as courageous as Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel had been before them. And thus began the New Testament church built on the foundation of Jesus the shepherd's death. The rest, as they say, is history. And we have been gathered into the church and become the good shepherd's sheep. That being the case, do we think it will be any different for us? that will float through life on beds of roses? Not if we want to safely make it to the holy land God prepared for us. Zechariah is speaking of us then when he continues. Two-thirds of those who remain in it will be cut off and perish, but one-third will be left in it. I will put that third into the fire and I will refine them as silver is refined, and I will test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. It shouldn't surprise us that if the shepherd suffered for us, that we sheep must also go through suffering. God uses that fire to separate the sheep from the goats. The Bible tells us that those who trust in Jesus, those who trust in Jesus will be a minority. A minority in the world, but even a minority within the pale of the church. Two-thirds of those who remain in it will be cut off. God prunes his church through suffering. But God also uses suffering to refine his elect like silver and gold. 
Jesus asks us not only to tolerate it, but to look at it as a blessing, a part of being his dearly beloved disciples. That's what he told the disciples in our gospel lesson. The Son of Man must suffer and be killed and rise again on the third day. If anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Losing our life, that is, putting all our hope in the life to come rather than the pleasures that this world promises us, gives us Christians an attitude so completely different to the way others think. While the world laughs, we Christians mourn. We mourn our sins. We mourn the Savior's death, which was caused by our sins. And we mourn for our world. Just a couple paragraphs earlier in chapter 12, Zechariah wrote, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace who pleads for mercy. Then they will look at me, the one they have pierced, they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. They will grieve bitterly for him as one grieves over his firstborn. The land will mourn each family by itself. You can't repent for another. Each individual must mourn his own sins. And when we do, we are washed in the fountain of blood from all our sins. So that a couple verses before our text in chapter 13, verse 1, Zechariah says, On that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem to wash away sin and uncleanness. There is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Maybe a third of the world calls itself Christian. Actually, I looked up the current numbers. 2.14 billion of 7.53 billion in the world call themselves Christians. That comes out to 28.4%. That includes all the people whose names are on the books of whatever churches, including the state churches of Europe, but never go. It also includes all those who worship a fake Jesus, the fake Jesus that's so popular today, who promises no cross, no suffering, but glory, wealth, and health. Two-thirds that fall away are those who never really trusted in Christ or those who trusted in a false Christ. And once they find out who the real one is and what he demands, that we take up our own cross, they leave. And that leaves one-third. Now, you may think I'm introducing a lot of math here, but it's not me. Zechariah put the math in this passage. We are the one-third of the one-third. We who believe in the real Jesus, the one who suffered for us and promised us a cross. We lose our life in this world in order to save it for the next. Or as Zechariah described, our souls get purified through the fire. Luther put it this way in his commentary on these verses. We are forced to bear the reproach of Christ's cross. The weakness of our king is exposed to us. He himself closes his eyes to the blasphemies of the wicked and keeps silence. Besides this, we are also 
compelled to endure our private and personal sufferings. Each of us has his own divinely imposed cross to bear so that we complete that which is still lacking in Christ's afflictions, as Paul put it in Colossians 1. This is what he here calls being led through the fire. But these, he says, take place to test you so that you are proved by the cross as silver is proved by the fire. Zechariah's prophecy culminates in the final chapter, chapter 14, with this promise, both for the workmen rebuilding the temple and for us awaiting the new temple. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. On that day, living water shall flow out from Jerusalem and the Lord will be king over all the earth. And that's what makes it all worthwhile. God has made you part of the one-third of the one-third. The one-third in the fire, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Expect the Lord to keep on refining you like silver and gold so you can trust and confess as they did. Be willing to lose your life for his sake and to have it saved in return. Rejoice to be part of the one-third in the fire. Amen.